All right, good afternoon. I think we're gonna get started. So please, you know, continue to have your lunch and enjoy it, um, but we'll get started with our program and I will um, introduce our ventures very shortly. But before that, um, I just wanted to share a few updates about the McCarthy's Venture Mentoring Network. We're really excited to have finished our um, first six months, that, which we considered our pilot phase. Um, and we're still alive and well and going strong and excited to be growing our mentor network. Um, I think we have close to 140 active um, mentors and steering committee members now, um, up from just under 100 when we started. So we've been growing and we're excited and, and we have some new faces here. Um, so if you don't know me, I'm Lauren Devil. Hopefully I've met or spoken with all of you by now, though. Um, so thank you for coming today. We have four great ventures um, that are going to present today. These are all um, Commonwealth Coffee is a recent alumna, alumnus of Northeastern, and the rest are all current students. So it's a great mix of ventures. Uh, I'm sure you'll be excited to hear from them. Um, oops. So I thought I'd added one side. So a couple just general overview reminders as well. Um, we have these blue forms. If you are interested in um, any work helping with any of these ventures today, please make sure to just write your name at the top and, and let us know which ventures and which areas you think you could help with um, or would be interested in, in working on. Um, and then I also, uh, we have recently built out a new uh, mentor database. And so in the past, you've kind of scribbled out your um, mentor information by hand. And so now we're digitized. Um, but I do want to get everyone's profiles up into that database. Um, and so I'll make sure at the end to put up the URL. I, I made a short shortened URL. It's bit.ly um, slash VMN mentor. So it's a five minute form really quick, but that way we can have all your information, your resume in our system so that we can do a better job with matching mentors and ventures going forward. Um, so just a couple of reminders there. And then uh, the steering committee will also be meeting afterwards at 2.30 upstairs in room 406. So still in Egan, um, but 406. So without further ado, I will introduce Olin from Commonwealth Coffee, and he will tell you about his venture and where he could use mentorship. All right, guys, how's it going? Um, good afternoon. My name is Olin Nelson. I graduated from the College of uh, Humanities and Sciences in 2013, uh, formerly the College of Criminal Justice, but they decided they wanted our money, so they switched it over. Um, so now I'm doing uh, Commonwealth Coffee Company, the founder and CEO. Um, and before I begin, I just want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, as a young entrepreneur and somebody who did not start in the business field, uh, it's really encouraging to have so many people out there helping and, and giving such great advice. So I, I do appreciate you guys being here. Um, so you might be asking yourself, how did you go from uh, a criminal justice background to a coffee background? Uh, so after Northeastern, I worked for and still working for uh, the Office of National Drug Control Policy out of Washington. Uh, I'm an intelligence analyst for them, and one thing that you've come to very quickly is that government work just positively will not function without coffee. Absolutely can't happen. <laughs> so, you know, we go through two, three cups a day at the office, and the, the piles of paperwork just keep coming. Um, so, um, I was kind of a hobby coffee brewer at home. Um, I, I brewed anything from jalapenos to hops, and yes, I've tried bacon, and it's delicious. Um, and you know, eventually I started bringing it to work, people started asking about it, and before I knew it, I had a coffee racket going of four liters a day. Uh, so that kind of, you know, spun the thought in my mind, oh, maybe I have a business here. Uh, did some research, the cold brew coffee uh, phenomenon is taking off, especially this summer, uh, and I'm looking to get in on the action. So the uh, Commonwealth Cold Brewery was born. Uh, a little bit about cold brew coffee for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, I do have some samples in the back, so please, uh, if there's any left, please get some and give me your feedback. But essentially, cold brew coffee is instead of a boiled water added to beans for four and a half minutes, uh, essentially you steep the beans in slightly chilled water for 24 hours. And what that produces is a naturally sweet, 67% less acidic coffee product that's ideal for iced coffee. So this is a nice coffee product. Um, and it's actually, you know, we market it as a health food because there's no need to add sugar to cut through the acid that doesn't exist. Uh, and it's just naturally much more drinkable and flavorful. So looking at our actual target market, I um, mean, you can see there the, the absolute, you know, huge industry that is the coffee industry. Uh, it's a heavily segmented industry. You're looking at about 15% being in the ready-to-drink market. That's my particular market. 
Uh, and you can see there the, the rates by which uh, different consumer groups consume coffee. So we are a specialty coffee product. And you can see that 34% of coffee drinkers daily drink specialty coffee. Uh, and within our user groups, that's up 33% uh, in the last two years. So it's a he heavily, heavily growing industry. Uh, Folgers and Maxwell House are kind of, kind of out, and people really want to know where their coffee's coming from uh, and that it's of a high quality. So the overall cold brew industry grew at 10.7% by volume last year, making it the fastest growing uh, beverage by volume in the industry. Uh, so really excited to start to tap into that user market, especially in New England, where even in the winters we had this year, we drank more iced coffee than the West Coast. So just something to think about. Thank you, Dunkin' Donuts, right? Um, so looking at the actual industry itself, you know, it's essentially broken down into three different tiers of competition. Uh, now, the first tier, basically, you have the large coffee roasters. You have Starbucks, Stumptown. You have these much larger national chains with cafes. They're using their initial infrastructure and their resources to basically get cold brew out to the market. Uh, both of those companies, including Pete's as well, picked cold brew up this season, this spring. Uh, so they're just starting to tap into that market. Uh, then you have grocery store chains, such as Trader Joe's and Whole Foods, uh, who are producing products in-house for sales to their customers in their grocery stores, kind of adding another level to, to that. Uh, where I fall is actually in the independent companies. So we basically team with quality local coffee roasters to provide a high quality product in our regional markets and then look to expand our distribution further with bottled products. So you can see a list of companies there that are doing it. You might see a couple of those, probably Chameleon, Stumptown, uh, and um, sometimes milk product you'll see in Boston uh, today if you go to the grocery store. Um, and really, this is, it's a race to the start, especially in New England. There's, there's no established bottler of cold brew coffee in New England currently, and as I mentioned earlier, we're the biggest consumer. Uh, so that's definitely a very exciting market. So what sets us apart? How are we going to capture the market? How are we going to compete with these other more established companies? Uh, essentially, we're the first cold coffee beverage company to operate like a craft brewery. Uh, my concept is to marry the craft beer industry along with the specialty coffee market and, and use those uh, marketing strategies as well as quality control to kind of integrate our product into the market and, and establish customer loyalty. Uh, so if you look at our Commonwealth Cold Brewery, we're establishing that in the Commonwealth Kitchen. It's a culinary incubator in Dorchester. Uh, we're very excited to work with them. They're a nonprofit and they're, they do great things for the community. So uh, we'll be setting our shop up in August. So we're pre-revenue at this time. Um, but basically we micro-roast and micro-brew our coffee, allowing us to have the highest quality coffee uh, cold brew available. Uh, we also use, um, as you can see, I'm kind of sorry, I'm reading down the line here, but we have seasonal blends, single origins, which are basically like your Tanzanians, your geisha, you know, kind of really special coffee. Uh, so we're using those as a higher price point uh, and premium product. And then we have flavor coffee blends as well because we know Dunks has to have a hazelnut, has to have a blueberry, has to have you know, almond. So we're trying to also tap into and, and, and convert people to a healthier option from those kind of syrupy flavors. Uh, and then probably our most novel market strategy approach is to actually use a two-tiered approach to gain kind of market presence. Uh, the first is a bag and box, which you'll be most familiar with with the actual three-liter wine boxes you'll see in stores. Um, we're using that aseptic packaging for its shelf life as well as its bulk uh, capacity. And then we'll eventually go into retail bottles as well. So these are our releases. We're doing a rotating seasonal. Uh, our pumpkin spice is fully formulated for the fall, uh, which people absolutely love. Uh, and then we have you know, citrus fruits and uh, a smoky blend for the summer. So we're still formulating a couple of those blends, but uh, we're ready to roll those out as the seasons come along. Uh, our single origins, obviously, this, this represents our pre premium um, kind of package. Uh, different company, uh, coffees, depending on their region availability, such as a Kenyan AA, a Geisha, or a Monsu Malabar, based on their rarity, will be a different premium price point. Uh, and that'll add media buzz to the kind of specialty coffee industry, uh, keeping our name kind of in the, in the media. And then Nitro Cold Brew. Has anybody had Nitro Cold Brew? No one's tried this. It's excellent. If anybody has like a nitro stout, it's kind of a craft beer guy, girl. Um, it's excellent. It, it foams, has a head. It, it's, it's a really, really interesting um, kind of collaboration between those two industries. So that's an, another approach we're taking. So tier one, just kind of break down where I'm at to hoping to get some of your guys' feedback on these operations. Uh, tier one, we're doing the bag and box. So as I talked about, that's we're targeting food trucks, restaurants, corporate catering, and offices with, with this initial rollout. Uh, so we're using their initial infrastructure and customer bases to kind of get our product out there. 
Uh, the food trucks is actually 10 that operate in the culinary incubator that I operate out of. Uh, so we're kind of pushing them out the back door and into that retail, so distribution costs are zero. That's kind of our initial entry, entry strategy. Um, and then we have some alternative distribution methods as well, and these are kind of both a marketing, sales, and uh, advertising avenue. Uh, so we're looking to potentially pair with Dashed and Uber, which have huge, huge customer bases to help push our food on a promotional basis, or our coffee on a, a promotional basis, to get to customers who use those services. Um, and then we're also potentially looking at getting a cold brew bike to bring to you know, uh, farmers markets, to bring before Red Sox games, to bring down to Copley, to Faneuil Hall, to help you know, basically have a mobile advertising and sales platform. Uh, and there'll be little kegs in there to, uh, to sell out of as well. So then we're looking to do a marketing and fundraising campaign from there to go into the kind of retail bottling uh, sector so we can go more wholesale and expand our distribution. Uh, so we'll do that through a website launch. We'll do some different design marketing uh, as well as a Kickstarter campaign to actually purchase the technology to make a bottling line. Uh, and hopefully we'll use the media traction from that to go into our next spring summer push next year. Uh, with that push will be wholesale bottling. This is kind of the, the marriage between the craft brew industry that I talked about. Uh, and we'll be targeting grocery stores, convenience stores, restaurants, other retail and corporate catering uh, as well. And that'll be, you know, once we've established our brand. Um, and then finally, I think it's very important to also have, you know, a good moral center for a company. And as many of you may know, the coffee industry has kind of been, had a long, poor history with, with fair trade and, and kind of exploitation of farmers. So uh, we're looking to pair with uh, social entrepreneurship programs as well as run our own, uh, but looking at the chain collaborative as well as root capital to actually when we can't buy fair trade, go into these communities, go down to the farm level, and actually build infrastructure for these farmers. So a, a portion of the profits will go towards uh, those types of programs in, in, in building uh, better lives for the actual growers who do all the work, really, in the coffee industry. Um, so that's, that's my, my spiel. What I'm looking for from you guys um, would be wholesale sales strategy. I'm a brand new company. I'm pre-revenue. I'm just starting production this month. Uh, but I'm looking to see you know, which accounts, uh, which companies to target how to structure these types of deals, who, who you know, would you go after the chains first, do you go after the small mom and pops first to get your name out there. That kind of initial sales approach for a wholesale I think is gonna be very important in building the brand locally and then eventually regionally. Um, and then distribution and pricing structure. Um, I, I would love to hear anybody's thoughts in terms of higher volume versus, versus a, a high price. Um, and anybody's expertise in that kind of wholesaling uh, retail arena would be very, very helpful uh, at this juncture. Uh, so I thank you very much, and I'm, I'm open to uh, any questions. Please. I think she's going to repeat. OK. Yep, so I, question is, just because we're live streaming, I'm just going to repeat the question. So anyone listening in the live stream now or watching the video later will, will know the question. The question is regarding the market segments and the age range and whether um, the population, the older population is left out. Right. So we're not, this is not intended to leave any population out. These are just our target markets in terms of our largest consumer basis for specialty coffee. So that there's no doubt that we have people that are younger than 18 that will consume our product for sure, and people older than our higher age bracket. Uh, these are just our target market for specialty coffee that have the highest consumption rates. So these are going to be who our marketing campaigns are more geared towards, uh, and we find that are the higher purchases of this type of, of product. Thank you. Sure. So the question is whether or not you have a management team or any partners, or anyone else helping Olin with the project. So currently I'm a sole proprietor of the LLC. Um, working by myself, I, I brew, I sell, and I basically am doing kind of all the consulting to myself, um, uh, which has worked out pretty well so far. Uh, I have paired with a coffee roaster in Framingham called Hogan Brothers Coffee. They've been around 20 years roasting, micro-roasting specialty coffee. Uh, they, he's actually a Northeastern alum, so I'll try to get him here maybe next, uh, next lunch. Um, he's a Northeastern alum who's been in the industry a long time and has been a great partner um, in terms of the coffee roasting, formulating the flavors that I've made, 
and he's actually my wholesale supplier of coffee beans as well. Uh, so he's kind of my unofficial mentor slash, you know, uh, inside wholesaler. Uh, but currently, you know, I'm, I'm open to uh, any advice you guys have for sure. The question is whether uh, Olin has had any customer feedback at this point on any level. So during the idea program, which I just graduated in last month, uh, I ran about a month of customer validation, going around to different businesses, cafes, um, different corporate cafes, talking about how they might want it packaged, how a consumer might want it packaged. Uh, and I found that for the food trucks, obviously the bottling was not ideal because they have such small fridge space. For the corporate catering, they wanted the bulk option as well. Um, so in terms of packaging, I've, I've got quite a bit of customer feedback on that. Um, in terms of the actual taste, flavors, that kind of development as a craft brewery type, um, I've basically been using my office, my, my, uh, my government office as guinea pigs. Uh, I push four liters of coffee through there a day. I've went through anywhere between 25 to 30 different blends of uh, coffee through them as well as flavored blends. Uh, and obviously I, I basically sell it to and, and give it away to all my friends as well. So. I have kind of validated those market groups as being my target groups, um, but you know, generally people really are receptive to the idea of multiple flavors and almost always, uh, without my suggestion, kind of compare it to the craft beer industry. So I know that there's that kind of collaboration, people looking for quality and variety in their coffee. I think one more question, if there is one here in the back and then we'll move on. That's correct. Uh, other than cold brew, what else is there in that market? So, so the question is, um, within the specialty um, segment of the coffee market, what is there other than cold brew? So what is mainly fueling that market is the Starbucks effect. So you're looking at, you're looking at espresso-based beverages. So that's going to include the Starbucks prepackaged, like you know, cappuccino products. Uh, and that, those also fall into the ready-to-drink category as well. So Starbucks actually owns 80% of the ready-to-drink coffee market currently. Uh, that's starting to get more fragmented as these cold brew companies start to evolve and gain traction. Uh, but essentially, your, your specialty coffee market is going to be non-blended sourced beans of a certain quality. Uh, so that can be something you buy at the grocery store that's been specialty roasted, uh, or that could be you know, an espresso product you get at a cafe. Oh, no, that includes, that includes hot as well as well, yeah, and like I said, m many people are gonna be getting espresso-based products because of the influence that Starbucks has had in their cappuccino, you know, macchiato kind of stuff and on the market. So they've influenced that pretty heavily. So the question is, uh, the follow-up question is, ha um, have you determined what part of the market segment cold brew is of that specialty segment? So, the short answer is no. Uh, cold brew basically has been around a long time, mostly sold out of independent coffee shops that are privately owned. Um, I think the data, once the data starts coming out on how Starbucks is doing, it's, it's one of the largest publicly traded companies that will actually have to produce their revenue statistics. But um, you know, personally, I don't know. But as a whole, ready to drink coffee beverages on the beverage industry bottled grew 10.7% last year. So that's just a little indicator of, of the, how much that segment is actually growing. Thank you so much, Olin. Um, we will have time after the presentations to talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Um, so next up, um, I'm going to introduce Aman from Orbit Marketplace. He's a current student. Um, all of our ventures today have gone through the idea stage gate process. Um, and so, so we're happy to see the ecosystem in action. Um, but so I'll have Aman come up, and I'm just going to go quick. Thank you, Lauren. Um, thank you, everyone, for having me. I'm Aman. I'm the founder and CEO of Orbit Marketplace. Um, I <laughs> have been working on Orbit since uh, January of 2014. Uh, I came up with the idea when I was on the phone with one of my friends who was in between moving apartments. And I remember her complaining about how it was such a pain to move all the furniture and, and get rid of all of her textbooks and how there wasn't really a go-to platform to do any of that. I was half paying attention, so I, was, I just said, oh, why don't you just try eBay? Uh, and then she said, 
that she didn't want to individually box and ship every item to different people across the country. And then I just said Craigslist because I didn't know any other platforms either, uh, which she just ignored um, because it's Craigslist. And um, then I made a joke about how there are more apps out there on the App Store where millennials can set, set a radius and find someone to f date within that radius um, than to do something like buy or sell something locally, which I saw a huge potential for on college campuses and in cities where populations are so clustered and in neighborhoods, you're usually living with people who come from similar income groups and have similar spending patterns. Um, and because the turnover rate in college towns and cities is so high for apartments, I really saw the potential for that. So I stopped joking and started having a serious discussion with her. Uh, and that's how we came up with the idea for Orbit together. Um, so I'll go to the market problem. Yeah. Uh, so the problem that we found was that there's no uh, safe and simple way to buy and sell things locally. The most well-known uh, way of doing that is Craigslist, but well-known doesn't equate safe or simple, as the evening news will tell you. Um, and then as I did some research, I saw that there were a couple of marketplace apps out there, and they weren't really a huge step up. They were just an app where you could take a picture, put something up for sale, and it was just, when you open it, um, it was just a sort of collage of images that represent listings. And I didn't really think that the fact that they'd been around for about a year or two and they hadn't, no one really knew about them, it gave me the idea that they were obviously doing something wrong. So I didn't focus too much on them because I wanted to start from scratch and create a platform that was specifically for smartphones. So these are the other apps. I didn't paste the same image three times. Um, and as you can see, their UIs are pretty clustered and they all look fairly indistinguishable and overall lackluster. Um, so then I started working ground up to, to create a platform. And the vision that we have is not to replace Craigslist or enter the race with these clone apps. Um, our vision is to create a platform to see what friends and neighbors in your city are selling. So this is an actual screenshot of, of the app. But the idea is that if you look at a neighborhood like this, which is right off Northeastern in Back Bay, it, it, it's a lot more convenient to have a people-centric platform where you know the people or might know them through your friends of friends uh, by just setting a radius. Because the populations are so clustered, it's very likely that a textbook or a phone or a couch that you're selling or putting up an apartment for sublet, there's probably someone in your area who is looking for that or knows someone that's looking for that. So um, that's how we came up with the idea for Orbit. Um, and in a nutshell, it's social, hyper-local, and a marketplace. Um, the social media aspect of it gives it immediate trust and transparency because with, as we've seen in most social media platforms, you feel like you've known the person even if you haven't met them. Um, and it also creates stickiness from an app perspective because by making it social, we're putting it a notch above utility, so it falls between um, a utility app and a social media app, which makes it a lot more interesting and, and keeps people coming back for more because you can follow your friends and you can see what they're up to when they follow someone else or they make a listing. Uh, moreover, we also have potential for small businesses to join and make listings, so you can even follow a local store and, and see what they're selling. Um, the hyper-local part of it, I talked about a little bit, um, just the benefit of setting that orbit, which can be anywhere from half a mile to 50 miles, and you get to just avoid the logistics of shipping. Um, many times, we, I'm sure we've all had that experience where we buy something, and it's not as someone described that it was. So to be able to meet up with someone and see it in person and to verify the authenticity of the item, I think that that's a lot more convenient than making a trip to the post office and then you know, going back if they return it. Um, and as a marketplace, I would say that um, we've designed it only for smartphones. So for, for that reason, every, every inch of the design has been, is meant for a smaller screen. So it is very intuitive to that. Uh, and what makes it really unique is that it's designed for millennials by millennials. So one of the things that the most, the first thing that all the customers remark on is our design because they haven't seen anything like it. And beyond that, just how convenient it is to navigate on a phone screen that makes us sure that we don't need a website for a bit going forward. 
So that's Orbit in a nutshell. Um, we launched in, uh, in Boston in April, April end. Um, and within our first three weeks, we got 500 users. And we've been working on, we've been treating summer as our test period because we want to do city to city launches. We don't really see a benefit of something like this in the suburbs because everyone knows everyone and that's what garage sales are. But, uh, but with, um, and also by doing controlled city to city launches, we can plan our ad campaigns to make sure that they're very specifically targeted for the right audience. Um, and we, uh, am I missing anything? Um, oh, and just to give you a little breakthrough of the apps, uh, breakdown of the app, the, this is the Discover feed, which is um, where you would go to see posts by your friends or just random items being sold. You could discover random items. This is the wish list, which is a unique feature that we came up with where if you're looking for something, whether it's an apartment within a price range or an iPad, um, and if you don't find it on Orbit, or if you're just too lazy to search, you can go into wish list and you can type it in and you can save it. And the second that it becomes available, you get a notification saying this item in your wish list just became available. Um, this is the store where you would go to make your listings. Um, individuals can make up to 15 listings and then businesses can make over 15 listings and we charge a small monthly fee for that. It's sort of like an e-rental fee. And we're already partnered with certain small businesses um, that are promoting their products on Orbit. And what we found talking to them was that the big value that they saw in the, in the app was that you have platforms like Etsy where you can, once again, ship everything. But for a lot of businesses starting out or the ones who don't want to operate on a large global scale, they would prefer to meet with their customers in person and have that face-to-face -face conversation and see what they think of their product, which is a very different way of selling and it's a lot more personal. And I think that over the past few years, we've seen a trend of people moving towards mass personalization and expecting that in the products that they use. Um, the, and then we have the you feature where you have your profile and your followers and um, your payment history. Everything is very, has been made very official. So for every transaction, there is an invoice generated, which is more helpful to businesses. But for individuals, you also get to rate other buyers and sellers. Um, and then you have the chat feature where you can talk to people about um, whatever you're interested in and only the buyer can initiate the chat. So yeah, that's Orbit. So Man, before we move to questions um, from the audience, could you just tell us a little bit about what you're looking for from mentors oh, yeah, and sorry. what areas would be most beneficial? Uh, so if you guys have your checkbooks, um, uh, <laughs> So we're looking to, uh, to raise capital, is a more appropriate way of saying that, um, uh, people who can help us uh, acquire customers at a faster rate, and namely people whose expertise would fall under social media and or marketplaces. Uh, and we're also looking for help with PR uh, along with marketing. We have questions from the audience? Pat? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, my question is around uh, frequency of uh, users that we have currently, but yeah. what are the frequency in which they're posting live? Yeah. Questions around like social social platforms. Mm-hmm. Can you know activity in context that you just wonder what everybody's doing? Yeah. The uh, question is how frequently are the current users using the app and what's the frequency, especially with social as a main okay. element? Yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, what we've seen because we're still fairly new, um, it's hard to pinpoint the pattern of our users and say that's exactly how it's going to be for every city because we're only in Boston right now. But what we saw is that initially, uh, of the 50 users that joined, maybe only 10 would make a listing uh, and they'd make two or three listings. But now what we're seeing is that over 50% of the users who download the app on every, any given day will make a listing. And most of them tend to make anywhere from eight to 12 listings. We rarely have a user make just one or two. And because we've integrated some features, like you can share your listing on Facebook and you can add hashtags to it. I don't know why everyone loves hashtags, but they do. So, so because of that, we see that a lot of our users are coming back and because they're following their friends too, they tend to visit the app, if not daily, at least weekly. I would say 70% of our users use it weekly. Um, and those numbers can go up, but we need to 
because as we get more listings and more people on the app and all of their friends are on it, there's more of a reason to keep checking for what, whether it's what your friends are doing or just to find a good deal locally. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, so the we, question is, what's your business model? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we have, um, we're going to, going to be rolling out a transaction feed. Right now, the transactions are only happening through cash. But our next update, which is being pushed this month, we have Venmo and PayPal integration. So if you use the payment method, there is a transaction fee that's incurred upon that. And then also with the businesses on the app, we do charge them a small monthly rental fee after their trial period is over. One more, or one more. So we, yeah. yeah. So um, when you think it through, who's on the hook for the transaction? Are you in the middle? The seller. The seller only. Yeah. The buyer has a problem. Well, um, that's kind of why we uh, enforce the the meeting up, and we're, we're very clear about that through the app, even through the transaction, is because with um, if you're meeting up with someone and you're seeing an item in person, then you know, you. I think that it, it's sort of the buyer beware in that situation that you need to inspect it for whatever it is that you think the, your need for that item is. And if it works, you buy it. If not, you don't buy it. So, um, and also we think that buyers have a lot more choices, um, whereas for sellers, they have limited platforms that are actually convenient for what they're doing. So that's why our transaction fee falls on the seller side. Chad, do you have one more? Yeah. Um, Hi. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The so, question is, um, there's a one particular competitor, and what is Orbit doing to differentiate itself? Um, so, this is Close Five, as you can see, uh, and for one, Close Five only works within five miles of you. Oh. You keep answering the question with this mic. I will figure out. Okay. The Sorry. Um, yeah. So uh, the thing with Close Five and all these other apps is there's when I first started making Orbit, there was maybe only one app that did what it does uh, at the core competency of it. But yeah. there's probably a, a dozen or two dozen marketplace apps like this that all offer the exact same thing. And Close Five has been around longer than Orbit too. And while they might have the capital, I don't think that the product that they're offering is enticing enough for people, namely millennials to get on there and use it. And because they're all positioned as strict utilities, so you go on if you want to sell something, there isn't really anything to ensure that users would come back to the app. Not, not all of our users have made listings, but they still visit the app again to see what their friends are up to or see what's being sold. So I think that by the social media hook that we've added, I don't think that um, these apps, I mean, if you, so this is what you see when you first open any of these. Uh, Whereas Orbit is designed to be more like a platform. And beyond that, I think that as we grow and we get more users, we are going to get more businesses signing up too. So I think that it's, um, while you could say that there are competitors, but I think that we're trying to be more of a platform where everyone in the city, in any city, just has an online store to sell things on. And these are positioned more, once again, just like a Craigslist with images, where you just you know put stuff up for sale. It's not people-centric. It's not focused on the items being curated to your preferences or anything of that sort, so. Any questions on this side of the room they missed? Okay, so we'll move on to the next venture. Thanks so much, we'll, again, we'll have time at the end. Okay, so our next uh, venture, I will introduce Robbie from Washbox. Um, is James coming up also, or just Robbie? Okay, so Robbie from Washbox, um, they're both current students, and I'll let him explain what Washbox is all about. Okay. Well, uh, no, thank you for having me today. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and they say if you want to be successful, surround yourself with successful people. So it's a great room to be in. Uh, my name is Robbie Mathis. I'm CEO and co-founder of Washbox. Um, my CTO and co-founder couldn't be here today. He just had to leave for class. But uh, I'm a senior here at Northeastern in the business school and uh, doing a dual degree of economics. Uh, James is a CS major, um, very talented back-end developer. So I wanted to start off today, uh, something interesting I read the other day, uh, said that in 1900, only 2% of homes were constructed with electricity. 
only 20% of homes were constructed with flushable toilets. So at the time, these were considered modern conveniences. Obviously, our standard and perception of convenience, you know, they've changed over time. I'm sure no one in this room, you know, glares emiously at their neighbor's well at home as they walk to their outhouse with their candle, right? Um, so standards of convenience should change, and the point I'm trying to get at is that it should really be consistently improving over time. So a cornerstone of modern convenience has always been the convenience store. So here's a picture of a convenience store from about 100 years ago. And you notice it really doesn't look any different from convenience stores today. But that doesn't really make any sense. Again, convenience should be changing. Cornerstones of convenience should be improving as well. So what is no longer convenient about the convenience store? Number one, it's the distance regularity. So you have to travel to the convenience store. And most of the things you're buying, especially in the toiletry section, is consumable. So you're doing it on a regular basis. And you're not going back to the convenience store so you can shop for new types of products. You know, most of us are buying the same products over and over again. Right? We're not getting new toothpaste every month. Um, but we still have to go back to the same store to buy the same products. So number one is distance and regularity. Number two, it's overwhelming. So as consumers, we've kind of bought into this fact the only way to improve upon the convenience store model is make them bigger and have more options. And on some level, that's true, because just about every type of person can walk in CVS and they can find something that will probably work for them. But on the individual buyer level, this makes it a lot more overwhelming. Especially as college students, we first enter the market as individual buyers during our freshman year of college. Um, so most of us walk into a CVS, we see a row of 100 different types of shampoo, and most of us look like this. Now we're completely overwhelmed. <laughs> now we don't know if we need you know, shampoo for oily hair, for dry hair, we don't know if we want to smell like Ocean Breeze or if we want to smell like green apples. Right? So it's just overwhelming. Number three, and this is cost. And this is really just self-explanatory. Whether you're a college student or whether you've been in the workforce for a number of years, you want to make sure you're getting the best deal. And you want to make sure that the store three miles down the road doesn't have the same exact product, a little bit cheaper. So what would the ideal situation look like? You know, what would you know, the perfect world be? And that's really where consumers would never go to the store. They would never have to worry about you know, running out products, and they'd never be in that tough situation where it's like a really busy week. They don't have time to get to the store, so by Friday, they're stringing on their toothpaste trying to get one more day out. Right? Ideally, that would never happen. Uh, number two, options should be simple, popular, and high quality. And more importantly, they should be demographically specific. So what do I mean by this? Now, we shouldn't be looking at a row of 100 different types of shampoo that's meant to meet the market or the entire market. We should be looking at the highest, most popular products for our specific demographic. So that way, it's a lot more simple, a lot easier to you know, pick the best options for us specifically. Uh, number three, it's the cheapest on the block. We should be able to buy with confidence every time and knowing that we're not going to find out three hours later that Amazon has it a little bit cheaper. right? So. What we've done is we believe we've built the best foundation for this ideal solution, and that's Washbox. So we have a couple screenshots from our beta site right here. Uh, and you'll notice it's very simple. It's very intuitive user experience. So this is what the shopping page looks like. You log on, and you set your schedule. That's the first thing you do. So how often do you usually go to the drugstore CVS? Is it every month, every two months, every three months? After that, you start picking your products, and you'll notice in each uh, category, there's only three options. So these are very specifically selected options. We chose these by surveying college students and young professionals. And we found out what the most popular and the highest quality name brand products are in each price tier. So you're always going to have a low price point, a medium price point, and a high price point. Um, so obviously, the number one benefit to this, it's very easy to choose your option. Now, you know these are the most popular in my demographic. What's my price? That one. But an added benefit to this is we have lower inventory costs. So instead of like CVS or Amazon who holds you know, inventory for 100 different shampoos, we hold inventory for three, which means we have a lot lower costs. We're able to pass those savings on to the consumer. So all of our prices on our website, they're on par with the cheapest that you're going to find at CVS and cheapest you'll find at Amazon. And in several cases, they're even cheaper. We also have no membership fees and no shipping costs like other stores or a, a prime subscription. So where are we right now? Uh, so currently, we've launched an alpha site uh, a few weeks ago, and that was up for a few days. And really, the main point with that was just doing market testing. So we did this whole shotgun of different advertisements. Uh, we were on campus with you know, guerrilla marketing on on-campus tables with uh, you know, free drinks, getting people to post on Facebook, and different promotions and discounts. And we had our you know, website all logged on with analytical software. So we saw you know, what advertisements were working, what was generating um, you know, hits to our site, what pages were people getting stuck on, what products were most popular. So we had all this user data and all this user feedback, and we shut down the site after two days, and we started building our beta. So the beta has uh, a whole new website design, 
whole new product line and whole new user experience. And that's what you just saw in the, the screenshots. So the beta will be up for the next month or so. Uh, and we'll be gathering user feedback and reiterating as we do that. Um, and then in, in the fall, we'll gear up for a full product launch. And the main difference here is we'll move in with our fulfillment uh, or our supply chain partners. And one of those is going to be fulfillment centers. So that will handle our inventory receiving, picking, packing, and eventually shipping to the customer. And the other one will be our wholesale supplier. Uh, now, both these relationships are already established and ready to go. Uh, again, we're just kind of waiting to you know, finalize the, the product before we move in. And obviously, some user experience changes. So what do we need? Uh, as far as mentoring, we we're definitely looking for someone with marketing and branding experience. Now, we firmly believe that you know, as college students, we have great access to the college market. You know, we can go on campus, and we know where they aggregate online. It's very easy to reach them. But we, we really believe that the end buyers, uh, a large part of it is going to be parents buying these kits for their students and buying that subscription. Uh, as college students, it's a lot harder for us to reach that demographic. So if anyone has any you know, um, experience in consumer marketing, especially towards a parent demographic, that would be uh, huge for us. Number two is customer acquisition. So we are a subscription service. So a big part of that is making sure that we're retaining our customers and the lifetime of our customers is going to make it worth it for us in that. Um, so anyone with you know, kind of a software as a service um, marketing background or anything like that who has done customer acquisition on a subscription basis, that would be huge for us as well. And then lastly is front-end development. So like I said, uh, my partner and co-founder, uh, James, is a very talented back-end developer. And we currently built our beta sites in, um, in something called CrateJoy. And there's some severe limitations, especially on the front end and user experience. So we were definitely looking for any connections with front end web development who can really help us optimize our user experience. Um, and that's pretty much it. That's all I have for a spiel. If you have any questions, feel free to ask or come talk to me after. Thank you. So we'll take a few questions from the audience, if there are some. And I'm going to try and get the mic to people so that I don't have to be. Repeating quickly. Ready, Kish? Uh, this sounds and looks very much like the Dollar Shave Club. Sure. Uh, so have you studied that, their model? Because they, they've been hugely successful. And they've started giving uh, you know, Gillette a run for their money. So yeah. is, is this something modeled after? Yeah, it's, a, it's very interesting you brought up Dollar Shave Club. Um, it's a very similar model that we're going after. And it's really just. Dollar Shave Club with a holistic approach to all your toiletries. Good question. Uh, question: if you, you were asking about models with the parents and that structure. Have you looked at the the sheets, the uh, the college kit uh, model? So if you're a, you happen to have a senior in high school, you get barraged with uh, as a parent with all sorts of things. Your child's getting ready to go to school. You gotta buy sheets, you gotta buy towels, you gotta buy this, you gotta buy that, and they try to line you up on the whole thing. So it's not right. the, the consumable model, but it's the reaching that group. I'm wondering if you've looked at that. Um, we have a little bit. You know, there are some kind of parent blogs that kind of cater towards that. I'm not sure if that's what you're specifically talking about, but um, yeah, that's really what we're trying to reach into. Is you know those kind of empty nester parent, you know, sort of um, I, marketing. There are a number of websites, a number of companies that started based okay. on the premise of, I'm going to get to the parents of college students in this And case. they sell it as a kit. OK. Uh, I see what you're saying. No, we haven't looked into that, but that is very interesting. And then the next question, like, uh, is your model just kind of getting it for college students, or is this model a la Dollar Shave Club? It goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, so we, we feel our entry into the market is the college students. Um, and that way we can capture, like I said, you know, the consumers as they enter the market. We don't have to change their, their habits. But we think it is applicable to you know, every demographic. So once we have the college student demographic and the site and choices down with that, we can expand into other demographics and make it, again, very specific to them. Any other questions? All right, thanks so much, Robbie. Thank you. All right, and our um, final venture for the afternoon is Wizio. I'll invite Chris to come up. Um, there are also a group of students that have been working on this, also working with IDEA, um, and I will let Chris tell you all about it. Thank you, Lauren. Hello. Welcome to Wizio. What is Wizio, you ask? Well, Wizio is building a better apartment experience by sharing open source data with landlords, realtors, prospective tenants, and property managers. 
So Wizio started in January of this year with the Husky Startup Challenge, which we won first place. Uh, we started with the idea that we didn't like hunting for apartments in Boston. After more than 150 surveys of realtors and property managers and tenants, we found that there are two main problems on either side of the market. So for tenant problems, we found that online information just isn't that reliable. You see, sites like Zillow have postings mainly by realtors or property managers. Their main goal is to sell the apartment, not necessarily good incentive for posting reliable information. Uh, on the landlord side, the main concern is that the investment returns money, that the apartment's occupied, and that it's occupied by tenants who are going to pay reliably on time and not destroy the investment, the apartment. So how does Wizio solve this problem? Well, Wizio is a dual-sided apartment rating system. On the Wizio platform, the web app, tenants can rate apartments and landlords, and in return, landlords can rate tenants. Tenants can then see apartments they're interested in, uh, look at past ratings from other tenants, and pick a selected few number of apartments that they might want to see or even rent. Uh, Wizio takes those interested tenants and the apartments they're interested in, the profiles, and packages that data and sells it to realtors or property managers that are filling their own apartments. For, and we charge them a referral fee. Which brings me to the business model. There are two types of revenue. One is a pay per lead option. So these are uh, realtors who think they can convert many different tenants, uh, prospective tenants, into any sort of sale. So maybe they have a bunch of apartments and they just want a group of tenants that they can sell to. The other is kind of the pay per lease, which is more for people who want quality leads, tenants who already know what they want. Uh, those of, are, of course, more expensive and more rare. So where is Wizio right now in production? Well, we have four developers and uh, a business guy and a uh, property manager on the team. Uh, we've currently gotten to this alpha stage where we're testing amongst our friends and family and immediate community to try to really refine our minimum viable product. Everything in the left column here has been already developed. Uh, We'd like to be in beta stage, so developing everything in the middle column here, by September 1st, and then launch by January 1st. What beta stage means is that we kind of have the platform to really start generating revenue. We have the options to accept payment from realtors and landlords, and then the launch stage has to do with optimization of the site for landlords, property managers, and realtors. Really a full suite of features that can attract people to our site. So let's go through a walkthrough of what a user experience might look like. So when you hit the Wizio page, you might see some featured listings uh, of which uh, landlords or property managers might pay to get to the home page. Uh, I'm not going to click on any of these. Instead, I'm going to search for apartments in an area, say Beacon Hill. So here's some things that come up. We see some apartments that are available and not available. Pretty interesting. There are some filters on the left. I'm going to choose uh, the third one down, uh, the 4.8 rating, pretty good. Uh, but it's not available. There's an option to waitlist. Let's see. So I can see on this page there's a description, there's some pictures of the apartment, and then there's some user submitted ratings. You can see that the, although the rating is 4.8, uh, there are individual ratings uh, for things based on that apartment. So for instance, uh, the landlord has its own rating, the building, uh, pest control. Uh, we don't allow users to do an overall rating because a lot of times they can be very biased. You know, maybe they had one negative experience and so they're going to rate the whole thing a one. So we really, since there's a low volume of uh, ratings potentially, because apartments only have a turnover every year, maybe every two years, uh, we have to make sure that we gather as much data to really make an accurate rating for each one of these apartments. So I think I'm going to waitlist this apartment. I'm pretty interested. It's beautiful and I add it to my profile. So now I have this profile, and what Wizio can do is they can take those user profiles and sell them to interested landlords, realtors, or property managers. Uh, after more than 150 surveys, we found that uh, a, a lot of landlords and property managers and, and realtors are paying around 100 to $200 uh, for quality leads. And so this information can be really valuable to those people. So what are our mentorship needs? Well, we have four categories here. 
Our first is that we'd love someone with real estate market knowledge. Uh, if, if anyone here is a broker, we'd love to talk to you and uh, bounce ideas off of you. Uh, big data experience, you can imagine there's going to be a lot of data and verification is very important. Uh, strong web development background. If anyone has, a, has developed uh, web apps before, we'd love to talk to you. And scaling ventures, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people have experience with. So just to break down the first one, uh, we'd, we'd love to know which features of our product currently you find most valuable. And also, uh, we'd love in the future to automate some of what a realtor and a broker does. So if you're a broker or a realtor and like to help us with that, we'd love to talk to you. Re regarding big data, uh, this is our, our main concern is verification and sorting. So if you have any experience with that, that would be wonderful. And web development best practices. So this is our stack. These are uh, the languages that we use. If you have experiences back end, front end, or uh, have some suggestions maybe for even changing some of the stack, we'd love to talk to you as well. And finally, scaling a venture. So most of you have experience with this. Uh, we're having trouble figuring out uh, our hiring process. Currently, there are four founders and uh, two contractors that we've been using. And kind of navigating the legal landmines uh, with hiring, and especially uh, unpaid interns, is, uh, is pretty difficult. And so if anyone has experience with that, we'd love to talk to you as well. Thank you very much for your time. I will now take questions. Thank you, Chris. Any questions? I think it's kind of obvious why the landlord would put in the data, improve your database. Why would the tenants, how do you, what, what's the incentive for prior tenants to establish the improved database? Thank you for that question. Uh, obviously, it's, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem, right? Uh, we have to have tenant user ratings uh, to be valuable to the landlords. Well, the way that we plan on, you know, based on our surveys, uh, more than 100 tenants, we found that a lot of people have no place as an outlet uh, for experiences they've had. Maybe really great things that they want to share or really not so great things that they'd like to share about you know, different slumlords around here. Uh, and we, those people have incentive enough to post. But we add additional incentive. For instance, with this waitlist feature, say there's a really demand apartment uh, of which a bunch of tenants have waitlisted. Well, the order of that waitlist is chiefly important to the people who actually want the apartment. So say if you're a user who has rated past many past apartments and asked your friends to join the platform using a code, you may have a higher reputation. This allows you to be higher on the wait list, so you have a higher chance of getting any apartment that you want. So this uh, incentive allows us to incentivize the users who are on the site to post even more information and to get other users on the site. Does that answer your question? All right. Other questions? OK. Thanks so much, Chris. Thank you. So um, we'll have some time to chat individually with the ventures. But before we break, um, I just want to put a uh, few dates on everyone's radar. So our next Venture Mentoring lunch will be in September on the 16th. Um, you also have a card um, in front of each of you um, with a reminder about the Health Science Entrepreneur's 10th anniversary celebration on October 8th. And then we'll have um, our final lunch of the year, which won't be necessarily an exact lunch, um, in November during Global Entrepreneurship Week. Um, and that will be the same day as Nexpo, which is our big entrepreneurship expo um, that and Global Entrepreneurship Week each year. So just some dates to keep in mind. I'm, I'm also going to, um, while everyone's chatting with the ventures and amongst themselves, um, put the, the short URL for the mentor form up on the screen. So you can jot that down and, and hopefully fill out your mentor profile so we have everything that's up to date and accurate about you um, in our system. And then, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lunch, we have kind of wrapped our pilot phase, but we still really, really want to hear your feedback about the lunch format, about the program overall, about the venture meetings, the types of ventures that you're seeing. So please either let me know. You can find one of the steering committee members. Um, they have the green ribbons on their badges. Um, or you can email vmn at northeastern.edu 
call me, whatever. Um, any feedback you have is much appreciated as we you know, continue to scale the program and grow from here. So thank you all for coming. Um, it's been lovely. And we look forward to seeing you at future Venture Mentoring Network events. Um, and and I, what, we didn't get the high top, so we asked. So what I'm going to do is um, ask Olin to go to the table where his samples are. I don't know if there's any left. But if anyone wants to chat with Olin, you can find him there. Of Robbie, stay where you are. Chris, stay where you are. And Amon, where are you? And you stay where you are, and so you can. They each will have individual tables, and then um, we should be good. And yes, and a reminder. Thank you, Dan. Please, um, if you're interested in it or you think you can help any of um, the ventures that presented today, please fill out your blue forms. Just your name. Check off which ones you think you might be able to help with. I will collect those. I can. I'll pick them up from the tables, or you can hand them to me. Um, or if you think you know anyone of the newer networks that would be helpful, uh, let me know. So. Thank you again. And the steering committee will be meeting upstairs at 2.30 in room 406. Same building. All right? Thank you.